Hello everyone, today we will discover the math behind beam bending by building an intuitive idea of how it works. In structural analysis, the amount of beam bends is very important to determine its strength, as well as ensure its aesthetic integrity by preventing a building from looking like this. This property is called its deflection. Textbooks often credit Galileo's analytical attempt as the beginning of beam theory, but it was Leonardo da Vinci who first posed the idea that in a bending beam, some part of it always remains the same length, and thus experiences no stress. This is the first time the neutral axis was described. Galileo, about a hundred years later, added to da Vinci's work by proposing a way to calculate the stresses in the beam. Galileo's theory was wrong though, because he made the wrong assumption in the stress distribution. Don't worry about these too much, this is still just the history part. During the 18th century, Euler and Bernoulli come in to propose this formula to relate deflection with the applied forces and the bending stiffness. This would go unnoticed for the most part until the succession of structures that were using the theory about a century later. Since then, it's the bread and butter of many engineering calculations from structural to aerospace. Okay. That's enough history, let's get to proving the sucker. Here is a beam, it's just floating around the space for now, so we might as well turn it into a line and put the line on a graph. The shape of the beam's neutral axis is exactly the same as the shape of the graph, so our y-axis is deflection and x is distance from the left edge. One of the simplest cases is the cantilever beam. This means our left end cannot move in any direction and also it cannot rotate. Our right end is free to do whatever it wants. Let's place a load on the right end. The shape the beam makes is called the deflection curve. What we will be looking for is an equation that describes this curve. So y equals something. Let's flip the y-axis so that downward deflection is positive. Pick a point A on the curve with coordinates x and y. Let's use theta as the angle of the curve at A with the horizontal, so tan theta is the slope of the curve. This angle is now positive when clockwise because we flipped one of our axes. Let's show our sign convention just to give it handy. Let's pick a second point B on the curve, locate a small distance DS from point A. The mathematicians among you might have figured out where this is going, but I'm going through it one more time just for fun. This distance is measured along the length of the curve. Point B then has x coordinate x plus dx and y coordinate y plus di. It also has an angle theta plus d theta. For my next trick, I'm going to need to exaggerate the curve a little bit. That's better. Now, if we draw two lines perpendicular to the tangents at A and B, they will meet at a point we call the center of curvature. The distance from the center of curvature to the curve is the radius of the assumed circle that connects tangentially through A and B. This is an approximation which gets better and better as ds gets smaller and smaller. So we can say it's true. Recall that the arc length is theta times r in radians. So ds is equal to r d theta. Uh, you can prove that the angle at O is d theta for yourself if you'd like. Curvature is defined as 1 over rho, but it's more useful to us if we express it in terms of d theta and ds. Rearrange this, and here we go. Curvature is theta over ds. Those will be handy later on. Okay, um, I don't know how to tell you about this. But here is where we put on our engineering hats and make some assumptions. Most beams bend very little under load, so they stay relatively flat and their deflection is very small. This means that theta is very small. So we can say that dx is equal to ds. Now the curvature 1 over rho is d theta over dx. Another thing that happens when theta is small the slope of the curve dy dx is equal to the angle theta in radians because tan theta is approximately equal to theta when theta is small. 
So dy or dx is equal to tan theta is equal to theta. Now we need to find a way to convert the angle to the deflection y. Okay, these are the relationship we discovered so far. Let's plot the graph of theta against x. Now this will not necessarily be a straight line, but in our case of a cantilever with a point load, it is linearly increasing. So let's just show that properly. Uh, following our result that theta is the slope on the deflection curve, the slope of the new graph d theta dx, which is the curvature, is the slope of the slope of the deflection curve. We will use this to solve for y. Here's where physics comes in. Robert Hooke, that's this guy, found out that for linear elastic materials, the extension is proportional to the force applied. Euler then expanded on this by proposing the Young's modulus. Stress, that's force over area, over strain, the extension over length. This depends on the material properties of the beam and describes how bendy or stretchy the material is. Finally, the French mathematician Antoine Parent, and I'm uh, extremely sorry to my French audience, uh, related these to the linear stress distribution due to bending to show that the bending moment m is ei over rho, where m is how much the beam is trying to rotate according to the forces acting on it, and i is how much it resists bending according to its geometry. The derivation of this will be skipped in the interest of time. If there is enough interest, I could make a separate video about it. So from our result of curvature and bending moment, we get uh, this lovely equation. This is enough to find the deflection by integrating the right hand side twice, as long as we have an equation for the bending moment m. And how do we find that? Let's have a look at the cantilever example. Here is a cartoon of the beam. Uh, instead of a graph, first we'll be using a free body diagram. This is a simplified view of the geometry and the forces acting on it. On the left, we have the vertical reaction of the support and the moment reaction to prevent it from spinning. On the right, we have the applied force. Now we can draw the shear force diagram, which is the, the sum of the forces to the left of x, where x is any point along the beam. So this is essentially the integral of f of x. Next is the bending moment diagram. This is the sum of the moments to the left of x, but a moment is force times distance. So the diagram is the area of the shear force diagram plus any moments to the left of x. So this is the integral of v of x plus some initial conditions. If we rearrange m of x and substitute the result from before, we come to the Euler-Bernoulli equation. And that's it, we've come to the result we wanted. However, it is easier to integrate twice than four times. So this is the formula we will be using from now on. Finally, uh, let's use it to find the deflection of a cantilever. Assume EI is constant, so Y is equal to this. Uh, this is just the first equation rearranged and integrated twice. The bending moment is just WL minus WX. We can look this up in a table, or we can also think of it as a straight line with gradient minus W and intercept WL. Plug that in, integrate. Now we find A and B. Well, how do we do that? Initial conditions. Here's our cartoon again. At x equals zero, the deflection y is zero. So zero, zero is a point on the deflection curve. And if we insert it with the equation, we find that B is equal to zero. Now for the second initial condition, we need to dig a bit deeper. We don't know any other y's, but we do know the rotation at the support. So theta of zero is zero. 
but we said before that theta is the slope of the deflection curve, so the derivative of y at 0 is 0. Here's our derivative, and if we plug in x equals 0, we get a equals 0. And this is the final formula for the deflection curve of a cantilever with a point load at its end. Let's check with the tables. Yep, they just simplified it a bit, but ours is still the same. Well, this was a very simple example, but it works for everything, as long as you have m of x. Well, that's all for now. I hope you learned something new, and I'll catch you all next time. See ya.